Hello, thank you and welcome. We appreciate you joining us today. My name is Stephanie LaRue and I am the Associate Director here at CSREA, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. CSREA is an interdisciplinary hub that aims to build community with the public, among scholars and students working on race and ethnicity in and around the United States. We invite you to learn more about our programs and offerings on our website, www.brown.edu slash race. Today's event entitled Comparative Speculative Futures features a panel of literary and visual artists whose work engages the speculative and generative ways that explore the wide range of possible frameworks for the greater empowerment and self-determination of Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other communities of color. Our host this afternoon is Dr. Matthew Pratt Goodrell, Professor of Africana Studies and American Studies at Brown University. At this time, I invite Professor Goodrell to introduce our guests. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm also a proud member of the CSRA Advisory Board. And as such, it's my great pleasure to introduce our three talented speakers today. After the introductions, they'll each take a turn in the order of their introductions to share their thoughts on the present day dynamic and generative interest in the speculative. Our first speaker is Sloan Leong, a cartoonist, artist, writer of Hawaiian, Chinese, Mexican, Native American, and European ancestries. She's written and drawn two acclaimed graphic novels, Prism Stalker and A Map to the Sun, and has short fiction in Fireside Magazine, Dark Matter Magazine, and Entropy Magazine. She's currently living in, on Chinook land near what is known as Portland, Oregon. Danielle Jose Older, a lead story architect for Star Wars The High Republic, is the New York Times bestselling author of the upcoming young adult fantasy novel Ballad and Dagger, book one of the Outlaw Saint series, the sci-fi adventure Flood City, and the monthly comic series The High Republic Adventures. His other books include the historical fantasy series Dactyl Hill Squad, the Book of Lost Saints, the Bone Street Rumba Urban Fantasy Series, Star Wars Last Shot, and the young adult series The Sh Shadow Shaper Cipher, including Shadow Shaper, which was named as one of the best fantasy books of all time by Time Magazine and one of Esquire's 80 books every person should read. He won the International Latino Book Award and has been nominated for the Kirkus Prize, the World Fantasy Award, and the Andre Norton Award, the Locus and the Mythopoeic Award. He co-wrote the upcoming graphic novel, Death's Day, and you can find out more information about him and read about his decade-long career as an NYC paramedic at danieljoseolder.net. Afua Richardson is an indigenous African-American illustrator best known for her work on the Eisner award-winning series, Black Panther World of Wakanda. She's the recipient of the Nina Simone Young, Gifted, and Black Award for Artistic Achievement. Other works include X-Men 92, All-Star, Batman, and HBO's Emmy Award-winning series, Lovecraft Country. In addition to being an illustrator, she completed an undergrad at Juilliard and is a seasoned singer, songwriter, musician, voice actor, composer, and mentor to many aspiring artists. She's the creator of her upcoming graphic novel series, Aquarius, the Book of Mare. With that, let me turn it over to Sloan Leon. Good morning, thank you for having me. I'm excited to get into this with everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Sloan Leong. I'm a cartoonist, writer, and illustrator. Um, I'm most well known for my graphic novel, Map to the Sun, which is an Eisner nominated and Ignex nominated graphic novel about five young women of color. Um, that formed their school's first women's basketball team. Um, and I'm also known for Prism Stalker, which is a psychedelic uh, sci-fi adventure um, that has like psychic martial arts and explores um, the ramifications of like um, gal galaxy-wide colonization through like an indigenous lens. Um, and then my most recent graphic novel is Grave and I that I wrote and my friend Anna Bowles drew. Um, and it excavates the relationship between these two troubled women um, through the perspective of a sentient house. Um, and then my oldest work, which is like, was a very short lived fantasy epic, um, which I really still like, uh, it's called From Under Mountains, which is um, my first long form graphic novel. Um, yeah, so that's kind of some of my body of work. Um, I'd say I'm drawn to 
speculative fiction um, across genres, genres, whether it's like sci-fi or fantasy, um, particularly because I can just like replace the foundation of our assumed world um, and like reconstruct my own, which can be based on anything, which I find super freeing and just like ripe for potential and imagination. Um, I think a lot of our greatest like canonized sci-fi authors like past and present still take that element for granted. Um, I recently wrote an article for Apex Magazine for their indigenous futurist uh, issue called The Nature of a Natural Future, um, which is about how our outlooks uh, on our environment as um, indigenous people are already very you know, extremely far future. Um, and unlike anything you really see in our, um, I don't know, canonized science fiction um, canon, I guess. Um, like for example, granting rivers and plants personhood, which is something that a lot of native people have been doing for a while in order to protect them from us, from humanity. <laughs> um, that's not something you really see from even like our boldest writers today. Uh, I feel like they're generally our, our imaginations are still really entrenched in like capital, capitalistic, human centric carceral, carceral ways of thinking. Um, so I'm not super interested in rehashing those types of structures and ideologies in my work. And I'm hoping I don't know, I'm hoping in my work to try and explore more fantastic and like challenging futures starting from the ground up. Um, and I guess I hope it can like refactor kind of our readers base perceptions about what our far futures look like um, and kind of undermine their assumptions about our own world. Um, I think it also helps me connect to my heritage and ancestry because I can like extrapolate futures that um, kind of like widen the scope of what our people can do. Um, like I have a novel on submission right now that's like far future. Um, and it, it follows this like culture that's kind of a blend of like Hawaiian and Mexican people um, with, and their languages are blended and cultural elements and they're wayfaring through space in these gigantic um, mechs meeting giant aliens and getting into like alien court intrigue. Um, and yeah, it's just really fun. I think, um, you know, part of, um, like depression and anxiety is not being able to imagine positive futures or only ruminating on negative futures. And I think we have evidence to expect so many negative futures and a violent lack of imagery and stories around our positive futures. So for me, imagining all these, um, complex and vivid futures and worlds is like also just part of like maintaining like my sanity and like mental health. So uh, yeah, that's that's a little about me. So um, I will, so I'll just pass this over to Daniel. Thank you so much. Sloan, am I, it's me, okay, I'm muted. Hey everybody, <laughs> thank you. Sloan, it's really great to hear about your work. It's beautiful, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very honored to have been um, asked to talk about this, um, Concept, which is basically what I walk around thinking about when I'm walking the dogs and living my life all the time anyway. And so it, it's almost like I, I, it is like I have no idea where to even begin because there's so much on my mind about this, this variation of imagination as the key, as the path to how we survive the present and make it to the future and also create the future into something that's not trying to kill us all the time. Um, but I wanna start with this quote that I read in college. When you read a quote and it just, it feels like it's poking you in the eye, but in the best way, <laughs> because you can't stop thinking about it and it just becomes everything. Um, but Eduardo Galeano, who, who, you know, what a luminary writer. He told so many stories um, and he traveled the world telling stories and he took apart imperialism in so many different ways. And he did it with a smile and with creativity and imagination. Um, but he said, God willing, we can create a new language that is brave enough to meet the new dawn. And like, man, it's like, it's like such a challenge, you know, like, what does that mean? What is a, what, how can language be brave is really like the question that it implanted in me back then and lives with me to this day. How do we as writers 
how do we be brave, period, right? How can we be brave with our language? And it takes me back all the way to being a little, which, which, I, which I am and always have been and will continue to be. You know, I grew up a nerd, a, a Latino nerd, trying to find myself in books that adamantly refuse to acknowledge my existence. And looking and looking and completely failing to find myself and then having to make the move that so many young black and brown people have had to do for so long, which is to translate characters into something that we can recognize culturally, physically in different ways, to make that small adjustment in our head to say, oh, that's me. Okay, I'm that guy. That's why. That's what that means. And, and find a character that's not either a clown or is about to get murdered so that the main guy can have revelation or a bad guy <laughs> and, and, and find that humanity there and then try to roll with that. But that's a lot of work. Like, let's talk about the labor um, that we're asking young people to do when we refuse as a, as a culture to give them books with people that look like them. It's a massive human rights violation to deny entire groups of people the ability to see themselves, ourselves as protagonists. And I remember wrestling with that, but I didn't have a language brave enough to help me wrestle with that. First of all, I was a kid. <laughs> Second of all, that language barely exists, right? Like we can, we can find it in academia and we're creating it now in some ways as we move forward, I think. We create it with our work, but I didn't know what it meant. I knew at some point I got tired of looking, I got tired of translating, I got tired of disappointment. I got tired of the feeling that the genre that I love so deeply doesn't love me back. And I walked away. In the middle of that, I did have a seventh grade teacher named Mrs. Inez Middleton who saw me in that x-ray vision superpower way that, that teachers have and knew me better than I even understood myself and took me aside one day and handed me a copy of an Octavia Butler book. A book, you know, that completely was way over my head. And that was kind of the gift of the gift was that she knew that I needed to be challenged, that I needed to see something beyond the same old, like white people fantasies that we were force fed over and over and have some vision of the future. That in its own right was a, was a radical way of changing the future for this one boy, me. And it was like, I was thinking of it as like a little bit of a time bomb, right? Because Further down the road, I, you know, I walked away from all that sci-fi stuff, just desperate for someone who would tell me the truth. And, and I fell into the arms of those great critical thinkers and historians and people who were dedicated to talking about history and the world as it is and as it was, as it will be. James Baldwin, Bell Hooks, um, Eduardo Galeano, you know, so many of these other great thinkers, Roy. Um, and Roy. And, and, it took me so long to come back around to feel somewhat healed enough to even pick up another fantasy book and give it another shot. And when I did, it was freaking Harry Potter, <laughs> which was huge at the time. And it, you know, we're back to that all white savior, white world fantasy of you know, this same old European stories being rehashed and regurgitated, whether it's in the motifs, the stories themselves, or the idea that this one single white kid is gonna save us all from some you know evil sorcerer, and um, and I enjoyed it. The, I enjoyed the third book, um, but you know I was mad. <laughs> I was still mad, and and then it was like uh, the time bomb finally erupted, and I I rediscovered Octavia Butler. I was teaching in Bushwick at the time, and the kids were reading her, and um, and I just I read everything that she wrote, and the world around me began to change because suddenly it was clear to me, someone had given me permission at that point from beyond the grave to be able to tell stories that weren't the same old thing, that dealt in a complex, audacious way with power, and that dealt with race and gender and all the other dynamics between us without sacrificing story, without putting them in the way of things, without being preachy, which is what we're told by critics, by teachers, all kinds of people that the second that you bring any kind of politics into the work, never mind that politics is always in the work, it just automatically becomes preaching and then you're just on your soapbox. Um, Octavia Butler came along to tell us that that's a lie. And she did it with her work. And she used story to show us another way forward. I always think of the quote 
I always think of the quote, there I go, um, by, by the poet Antonio Machado, who said, Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. Walker, there is no path. You make the path by walking. You make the path by walking the path. So tus huellas, tus huellas el camino. Your footprint, your footsteps are the path. And, you know, <laughs> you can only follow certain paths at a certain point, and then you have to own path, which means that you have to take out your machete and start whacking away. And that's where my body comes from. Um, Shadow Shaper was really the book that burst out of me um, from that experience, that love and rage that I felt in that dynamic dichotomy stuck between, you know, Harry Potter and the same old, same old, and Octavia Butler saying something that felt so fresh and so new and alive and was also very old and, and reaching back into these long lost histories of resistance in literature and especially in speculative and imaginative literature that really are part of path forward. So when I think about this idea of what it means to create a brave, brave language to me to dawn, I also think about the notion that it, they say when you write a story, when you tell a story, you light a fire in the spirit world. And I think about that and I think about the stories that we tell and the stories that I try to tell and the truths that we try to bring out and the resistance that we get, whether it's from publishing or critics or trolls or knows what or everything else. And I think sometimes it's not just about creating a new language to meet the dawn, but if we light enough fires, we become the dawn. Thank you so much. Oh, and now I'm gonna pass it over <laughs> to Afua, who is amazing. Get ready to see some art. Hello, hello. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much everyone for being here. Um, my name is Afua Richardson. I'm a comic book illustrator and a musician. And um, I, I'm just going to share a little bit with you about how I became an artist and why it is medicine for me. Uh, I grew up in New York City to a cut and paste graphic designer with schizophrenia and a physicist. And so um, art was something that enabled me to develop my emotional maturity. It enabled me to take a thought or a feeling and make it real. And so while I watched Star Trek with my dad and we talked about escape velocity and the possibility of this fiction becoming real and, and what technology was available in the 80s, I started dreaming things of my own. My dad would give me tools to draw what was in my mind, even though I was a little shy and didn't trust that all the time. At nine, I started playing the flute and that was another way for me to speak. Now I had an objective, I had a discipline that if I practiced this thing and sat the right way and breathed the right way, that I would be good at an instrument, that I was the instrument too. And then once it became more serious and uh, I started performing places and getting over my fears, um, my music teacher changed. First, I had Mr. Rakowski, the stringent disciplinarian who taught me the fundamentals of the craft. Then I had Mr. Keene, the hippie who said, you know what? All that stuff that you learned, forget it. You know it already. It's in your veins. Now you're going to play the notes in between the notes. You know the song, you know the notes, you know how to play the notes. Now I'm going to show you how to feel. I think I was 11 years old the first time I improvised on a stage and I was terrified and I've been terrified ever since. <laughs> but it taught me a few things. First, we as creators 
observe. We take our experiences. And while I talk at you, I'm going to share my screen. We observe, we retain, we repeat, and apply. So with all of these things that I learned, all of these different disciplines that I engaged in, I was observing my surroundings. I was applying it to something that I loved, which was comic books and superheroes and science fiction. And then, let me show this moment. There we go. I had the opportunity to make these. What I saw in my industry of comic books was that there were a lot of people who didn't look like me. And my father, in addition to being a physicist, was also a sculptor and a builder and a photographer and an oil painter. And I would hear his stories about the scholarships that he was denied, about the fact that his mother spent three years in jail for passing a voting test. And because there was no female prisons at the time, she was placed in a chicken coop outside. And she could barely stand up. But she still became a nurse, owned her home, raised children, some of them not even hers, and lives in that house still. She has the bravery to be kind, despite what's happened to her. And that to me sounds like a superhero. And so what I saw in New York City, in my family history, in my own family was that reality and fiction were missing something. My fiction didn't have what I saw, which were people who despite their circumstances became fantastic were fantastic, that in the middle of chaos, that they were able to create something beautiful. They had the world stacked against them, just like every protagonist in every story. And still, they made music, they discovered things, they innovated. So what's my excuse? What I had to do for me was figure out how I could be of service with my work. What's missing? What isn't there? I didn't see enough women with real hips. I could get angry, which I did, but I could also get to work. There is an opportunity. Art is a service. We entertain, we inspire, and we innovate. We know what the standards are and the craft is going to choose us to evolve it. And the people who came before us, they weren't made out of no fluff, you know? These were people who were strong and despite what happened to them, despite every attempt to diminish them, they bloomed. So that is what I want to create in my work. I've had the opportunity to work for Marvel, DC, Kodansha, Abrams, just all of these different companies. And what they are telling me is that they trust me to dig into myself and envision their vision. So how do you become that? How do you make yourself ready to be someone they call on? You have to know what it is that you like, first of all, because you're gonna be sitting here a long time making things and you're not gonna feel like it all the time. You have to innovate, which means you're coming from two different disciplines to bring something new or bring you 
to this industry. You are what's missing. You are what's needed. I'm not the best. No one is the best. But our stories are important. Because in the end, all we're going to be is stories. And whether or not we tell those stories correctly, and whether or not we push our imaginations to envision ourselves in a future that we want to be in, no one else is going to get it right. So we have an obligation. We have a responsibility to pave the psychological permission for the people that are coming after us to dream and dream boldly. I'm making a book because of a question. Are mermaids just a European tradition? That's okay, you know, chupacabras are Latino, that's, that's fine. And then when I started to do research and I saw that Japan had the Ningyo, that the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia had the Sabawa Ilnu, that the Inuit had Sedna, that Southeast Asians had Naga, I thought, okay, there are a lot of stories that have not been told. And there are some that take the forefront. Why have I not heard of this stuff before? Is it because they don't think it's important? Well, I think it's important because in my native culture, Choctaw, Creek, Cherokee, stories are sacred. Stories are information, wisdom, not just how to do something, knowing when to. So as uh, the late prince said, dreams of the life we lead, the things that we create are paper dreams. So you are providing the fuel for tomorrow's dreamers. And I look forward to talking to you more about that today. And I'll hand that over to you, Matt. Thank you, Afua. Um, I want to bring our panelists back into the group here and I'll wait for the screen to populate with them. Um, to get us to get us started, uh, that, those were three wonderful comments and I'm, I'm struck listening to them uh, by how incredibly productive this particular moment is, like so much interesting work happening in the realm of the speculative right now. And I'm also thinking about um, the lovely line that Afua shared with us about art being service and about uh, Daniel's you know, narrative of the discovery of Octavia Butler and what a transformative moment that was for him. And I'm wondering how it feels to each of you to be in community with so many people right now working in the speculative. How does it, some, you know, some of you uh, may have, uh, have no memory of what it was like before, but it strikes me that there's been just in the last 10 years, such an explosion of interest in the speculative. And I'm wondering if you can comment on whether you felt that difference and how, how it feels to look around you and see other Octavia Butlers and to be Octavia Butler for other people. Like, to think of your work in relation to your contemporaries. Well, come on in, y'all. <laughs> we're, we're about to start talking, but I didn't say anything. Go ahead. Oh, oh me? Oh, goodness. Wow. Um, there has definitely been a fantastic change. It's really beautiful to see. When I first started going to comic conventions, uh, especially something like New York Comic Con, it was in a small little room and there may have been about a hundred artists in there. And I was still a scrappy kid, just a band nerd who was a part of all these underground hip hop crews and not even considering art was a possibility as a path. 
Um, and then when I got there and I met people like Sanford Green, Curran Grant, Aletha Martinez, Gail Simone, Celia Kyle, Louis Small Jr., Brian Stelfreeze, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I didn't know any of these people. I didn't know they were, I didn't know that, I didn't know that person was a woman. I didn't know that person was black. All I had was their artwork. And then all of a sudden, psychological permission granted. Why not me? Here they are, they're doing this full time. What is the path between me and that? Repetition, not practice, perfect practice. Let me figure out what that is. Let me ask them, they're right here. They're right here, they're so accessible. Here's the artist, here's the writer, here's the editor, here's the CEO of the company coming from music. Do you know how difficult that is? You have to have a manager to get an appointment, to get a, uh, a showcase, and then they'll consider whether or not you're ready for the industry. But here was such an amazing opportunity to speak directly and spend a little bit of time with creators and then watch it grow. Like take their advice and, you know, turn it into my own Jeet Kune Do, like see what works and get rid of the rest. And then more and more as I started going to conventions and I was speaking to more students and they were trying to figure out how to turn their art into a business, I would just share what I learned because the creators before me shared what they learned. And I don't, I don't care about sharing my technique. The more people can express themselves, the better. Then we can form Voltron and save the universe my goal um but oh my gosh it's there's been an effort an organized effort to push forward and include people and now now that now that we're all here all right let's see what you got and we've been we've been calling for this you know and so now it's time for people to bring their best and I think they have been, and it's amazing. And I can't wait to see what comes after that because there are people who are growing up who don't, like they're going to be in a world where superheroes and protagonists and bad guys and anti-heroes look like them. So their possibilities, they have choices because media gives us a template for ourselves. We, we, don't like to admit it, but we identify with these different archetypes. We take a little piece of them and they take a little from us, but these different characters and fictional stories enable us to consider possibilities and work them out in our own lives. So I'm just, I'm excited. Um, just seeing the success of something like Black Panther come in and say, listen, here is a predominantly Black cast and it's not just for Black people. It's for everyone and everyone enjoyed it. Not everyone enjoyed it. People are allowed to not like things. That's fine. They just don't count. No, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's really exciting to be, you know, to, to start from being one of the only Black women in comics and that's why I won the new Simone award I, I was one of the few I, I really couldn't name two others that was a penciler inker and colorist for Marvel DC and Image none they were there what why were they not making comics was there a gate I got in oh they thought that they couldn't okay now you know that you can so come on in water's fine we're waiting Thank you. Sloan, Danielle. Go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> I don't want to cut you off. Um, yeah, exactly what, exactly what I feel say. We're in a renaissance right now and it's across the board and it's amazing to see and be part of and it's so exciting. And I, I feel like it, it's, I, I kind of came up in it as it was rising too. So I don't have as much, like, I, I do remember the feeling of just being all alone. Um, but some of that was also just being really new and nobody knew who I was. Um, it was Cherie Renee Thomas, who's an incredible editor and writer uh, who did the Dark Matter anthologies back in the day, which are amazing. And 
just way ahead of like where everyone else was in publishing years ago. Um, and she really, I took a class with her and she really just brought me in. She had, she has so much room under her wing and, and Tanana Redu after her, you know, just an incredible being, an incredible artist. And um, I just, you know, I just honor these women so much because they, they were so real with me. And that's true community, that's true mentorship. It's not um, people best men for each other or like upping each other when we're doing crap, like pretending everything's gonna be all right, because it's not. And also <laughs> we go through it, you know what I mean? Like those, those two truths do walk hand in hand as we think about both the future in the large sense of it, you know, like what we're talking about right here in this panel and also career-wise, you know, like things go up, things go down, things get sour, things are messy. Publishing is racist, we have to do that. And that's a complexity of that's a reality of the world, you know. So uh, true community and true leadership and true mentorship acknowledges that and helps you do it. it gives you the tools mm -hmm. you know, works with you is is one is together with you in that. And that's what we've seen too. And I think the last thing is that a lot of this wouldn't be possible without um, online culture, quite frankly. And and mm -hmm. yes, it can be bad sometimes, um, just like real culture, <laughs> a real world, IRL <laughs> culture, whatever you want to call it, right? It's still real mm -hmm. online. Right? Um, but at the end of the day, like what it's facilitated is a rise in our abilities to have these conversations across physical place and time, across cultures that weren't happening before. And they're uncomfortable sometimes because we haven't had them before because, and sometimes we haven't had them because they're uncomfortable, but either way, <laughs> they need to be had and we're able to have them. And you know, it does get messy, but what it also does is create an ability of, for community to happen. You know, I'm friends with writers that I've never met in real life, and I might never meet them, but we have an understanding, we have a community together, we know how to check each other and have conversations, sometimes in public, sometimes off to the side. You know, those are the dynamics of community, and they are messy, and they are complex, and it's not simple, and, you know, there's no one way, but, you know, that's what it is. I think at the end of the day, it comes back to responsibility. We, we, take, we all take it very seriously. And we struggle with it. We don't always get it right. And, but if we're in community, this is how you know, we deal with things. So short, short answer, yes. <laughs> what an awesome yes. Yeah, um, yeah, there's definitely been a renaissance in like mainstream media, um, kind of embracing uh, the work of people of color. I personally think there's always renaissances ha happening, um, but it's in small spaces. It's with small art. Um, right. I came up with like, you know, indie comics, people self-publishing their mini comics, little zines. Um, and they've been telling stories that no one, no mainstream publisher would ever want to publish. Um, and that's still happening um, mm -hmm. in the recesses of the internet. That's <laughs> I, I grew up somewhere where there was really no art culture except like you know in Hawaii there was like it's like what older white guys painting whales that was the extent of the art scene where I was from you know so I was like mm, okay so uh yeah I was online I was sharing artwork with other people other marginalized people of all backgrounds um and so I've never felt a lack of um you know access to stories or to images of Maybe not myself, but other people of backgrounds of incredibly from like tiny cultures, you know, that you wouldn't normally see. Um, so yeah, it is exciting to see these stories in the mainstream, but I think there's pros and cons there. Um, there's things with like, you know, um, kind of commodifying all our culture. I think one of the big things in comics and speculative fiction is um, having, utilizing like the like people of color as characters, but never actually promoting actual authors of color. Uh, I think basically using like the visuals of people of color and cultural icons to like flavor their work. I think that's a big issue. Um, I also think there's a lot of predatory practices in comics and, and writing as well. Like, um, and I think this is newly, I don't know. <sighs> I think, I know Afu was saying like maybe people of color think that, you know, they're stopping themselves from getting into these industries, but I've had, I don't know, like not great interactions with getting into these publishers. Like I worked for DC with Image and 
they're just, I don't know, they'll just straight up tell you that you're uppity if you <laughs> expect some sort of respect, you know, <laughs> like the, they're just like really shameless and cruel. And so I don't think it's that people are stopping themselves from joining them. I think they're just incredibly like ignorant, but also, and also like basically just like shameless and treating you however they want, taking advantage of you. So well, I understand the... <laughs> I understand the uh, hesitance to get involved with, with these. So yeah, there's pros and cons. There's uh, the exposure of our stories, but there's a, there's also the commodification and, you know, being taken advantage of for our stories. So it's a balance. I always think about both Blade Runner, the new one, the recent one, and Doom, mm. who have mm. you know, Black characters on the poster that I think have a total of like point. 72 seconds on screen and die immediately or whatever and like it's just like like There's somebody black on blade runner what <laughs> like five seconds like really it's really like <laughs> sidekick that gets killed quick it, and that's the thing it's like we do all this movement work right so much the reason that the bookshelf looks different today is because people were activists and and took risks and and you know it wasn't because publishers just decided to be nice, right? And, mm -hmm. and then like, and then like we 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 have wins, and then those wins, to Sloan's point, become commodified into like, all right, we'll throw a black person on the poster, and people will go to the movie thinking that there's gonna be black people in the movie, and then we'll kill the black person immediately, like, you know, like those. And so it's like we're always <laughs> maneuvering, I think, with that very manipulative and complex system. And you know, what does that mean? It, I think it, it means something different for each of us, right? And for each moment of us too, because there's moments when I'm like, you know what, F this, I need a break. Like, let me just go walk the dogs or whatever. And there's moments when I'm like, no, I'm getting up in there, I'm getting to the top and I'm gonna destroy it from the top down. And, you know, there's not one right way, I guess. Yeah, all right, I agree. I, I've i been going through a lot of transition and I've been kind of asking myself like, okay, what am I willing to do? What am I not willing to do? Mm -hmm. How do I treat people? I can control that. What power do I have over how people treat me? Now that's the one that really speaks to Sloan's point, you know, because there were a lot of artists who I spoke to, you know, pale complexions and they were getting ripped off. You know, like um, if any of you are familiar with uh, Adult Swim and that golden era of Adult Swim where everything that came through there was hilarious. You can look no further than Clay Croker, who was just this crazy skater guy who created all these cartoon characters, did all of these voices for a bunch of characters there and was so poor that he died a couple of years ago because he had an infection in his jaw. Now, many artists are treated like they're lucky if they get hired because a lot of these larger companies are, you know, the pretty girl in the room. They know if you won't buy them a drink, the person behind them will. So people are lining up to get exploited and what is the appeal of working for a large company? Oh, well, you get the validation that you know what you're doing, that you, know, you now have uh, uh, accreditation, exposure. Well, people used to die of exposure. So <laughs> you kind of take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> I want to I want to see if we can scale out from the industry a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in her comments, Sloan talked about the importance of uh, creating fantastic and challenging futures from the ground up to sort of shake up the certainty of our world. If not for reasons of sanity and mental health, Daniel talked about trying to make the future into something that doesn't kill us all the time. <laughs> I'm thinking of N.K. Jemison's notion that we write about broken worlds to break worlds, and also because mm -hmm. our world is broken. And I'm just wondering if you want to talk to us a little bit about this moment, about the, the dynamic relationship between representation and social change in a world that feels to, to many people to be absolutely and fundamentally broken. Right? Too, too soon? <laughs> Calm down. Uh, this is, I, I'll, I'll 
It's a tough one. I'll be honest. I'm just, um, you know, fluctuating between rage and sorrow and hope and, and sometimes they overlap and I, I don't, you know, know totally how to navigate them as long as I've been on this earth, you know, it's still more just heartbreaking realities than I can really, I think many of us, if not all of us can really wrap our heads around, especially this past year, two years. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't totally know what to do with it, you know, and, and um, I do feel like, you know, our, our, not our job as writers, like our job as humans, you know, is to process it. And, and, and those of us here, you know, do it through art. And, and that's the, the piece that's, that Sloan was talking about, especially is that art is healing, you know, and I'll say this, one thing I learned as a paramedic is that like you go into it and like, first of all, you're not a passive witness. And that's part of why I mm. took that job is because I think as artists, we get caught up in the notion that we can stand outside something and just bear witness to it and not be a part of it. And that's a lie. Mm. And it's a dangerous yeah. lie because it gets us into all kinds of really ridiculous and uh, power laden situations that we aren't fully um, being honest with if we don't own the fact that we're a part of every situation that we, um, create or, or, or record or anything else. And the other thing about being a medic is that you are always healing yourself first and mm. foremost as you heal others. And that's not just like a pretty, you know, notion that you put on a poster with a sunset. Like you really are cleansing yourself by taking action and the action of taking action, whatever that may be, um, mm. is a cleansing agent. It is a despojo, as we say in Cuba. It, it cleanses you spiritually and it helps you to get through to the other side of whatever's going on. People always used to be like, you know, how do you sleep at night? And I'd be like, great, I save people's lives. You know what I mean? <laughs> but also, like, <laughs> um, but we would be bearing witness to a lot of trauma. And, and the reason that we did sleep okay is because we weren't simply bearing witness, we were taking part in it on some level. And it didn't mean that we always saved people, right? We didn't. Um, that's a part of it. We're not gods. None of us are. And that's true of art, too. We make art that doesn't land, that doesn't hit its mark, that people aren't going to relate mm -hmm. to, whatever. But the point is, we are taking part. So as much as we are doing it, you know, for the for the power of story and the joy of it, there's also a part of it that's fundamentally healing in that mm -hmm. we are taking an action. We are speaking our, our truest language, and that's story. And And so that's kind of all I know how to do. I've been really prolific in this period not just because I'm on deadlines and, and not just because I love writing, but because I'm trying to heal. And that's the, that's the only way I know how. Mm. Yeah, I pull our Sloan, I don't want to- You brought the whole mood down. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of what I can add. I, I don't really know, mm. like I, I feel similarly, um, it's difficult because I feel like the context of culture and societal and social expectations is always marginally shifting. And it's an interesting challenge to be in conversation with that constantly um, and thinking about that when I'm making work and trying to get it published. And um, the only thing I know how to do is make my work as honest as possible and as close to my vision as possible. I don't think I have a lot of control outside of that. Um, I can't like orient my work towards one type of, you know, mindset or cultural moment because it's always shifting, it's fluid. So um, yeah, it's an interesting time to be making work. I feel like there's a very, I feel like our audiences are both very um, complicated right now in a way they weren't before. I feel like there's new facets to how they perceive and engage with work, mm -hmm. um, both in positive and negative ways. So yeah, it's interesting. I think right now, you know, we're, such a, we're at such a critical impasse where everyone is feeling this. No one's hiding, no one can hide from the situation at hand. And, and I look at, um, I look at some of the stories that my dad would tell me about our family and the kinds of things that they did. Um, I uh, have an ancestor who, <laughs> whose name was actually George Washington Carver, no relation. <laughs> and uh, he was a Choctaw and a boat 
builder. He was a ferryman. He would chop down trees. He would make a canoe and he would ferry people back and forth across the, the Black Warrior River. And so um, that in turn made a lot of welders and builders in my family. And one thing that they would say very often, if there is no way, make a way. If there's a wall, build a door. And if you're completely blocked in, um, you've got to rise up. And it's hard to right now because people are exhausted. They are absolutely <laughs> exhausted. And I feel like if they don't make things, they're going to break things. So I'm choosing to make things because that's how I deal. Um, I think about a lot of the music that was made during the civil rights era or even in like South Africa during apartheid with Hugh Masekela and just the ability to take that pain and take your frustration and then turn it into something that you can take it off of you and place it into a creation and just how much peace it can give you. You won't necessarily feel better after you've written a song. You won't feel better after you've done a painting, but instead of letting it rattle around in your mind and start to fester, I'm seeing people really get to work and, and I'm trying to encourage it as much as possible because that's what I lean on when I'm out of fuel. And so I think the importance right now for creativity and, and man, just even pay attention to like how people are throwing themselves into media. Like it, there are a lot of companies who are like, please give us your ideas. We are running out of things for people to watch <laughs> because people are flocking to fantasy for distraction, for entertainment, for medicine, for hope. And I feel like a participant, but also an observer. So I'm watching those shows too. <laughs> Running out of things to watch and yet they still made Outer Banks season two. So somehow there's still, there's still room for that. Right? <laughs> we, we have a, Not everything that's made is great now. <laughs> we have a process oriented question here that I wanna try to sort of reformat to link up to what we were just talking about that someone wants to know how we imagine futures that feel worth speculating on or fighting for and i'm thinking about um you know octavia butler's um overhearing conversations in the cafeteria between young people about what they would do had they been enslaved and then in trying to answer that question that they've asked pulling out what eventually becomes kindred and i wonder if you can you can talk to us about some moment in the present that you've used as inspiration for some speculative future um, in, in one of the things you've written, drawn, or produced. Is there, can you walk us in a process-oriented sort of way between something you overheard or saw or thought about in the contemporary that you then blew up in the speculative? It's funny, um, it, we always get this question on, uh, not that question, but a different question on um, panels when I do, uh, when I talk about sci-fi and dystopias, there's always someone that goes, what about utopias? Um, mm -hmm. And the easy answer, and it's kind of a, a, a dodge, you know, is like, well, that's like, <laughs> no one wants to read about a place where everything is working great. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> that's not true, but that's, that, that's uh, kind of what a lot of times comes up and, um, it is true that like, you know, for the for a lot of the stories we're telling, conflict is really at its heart, right? And I think there's a really great group of, uh, there's, there's work coming out that does speak to kind of the deeper conflicts um, that happen after things get sort of sorted out as if that was a thing that could actually happen, right? Like but there's this mm -hmm. line that we cross where everything is okay. I'm thinking specifically of Pet by Kweke Amezi, which is one of the greatest YA books to come out ever, but also uh, recently. Um, that deals a lot with that question, you know, like, okay, we had a, a huge revolution and we found some sense of equality in this country, but like, what are the creatures that linger after that? And, and what are the ways that we cover them up? Um, but but, uh, but it, the, getting that question all the time really did make me think about utopias and why I don't find them very interesting. 
And I do think like one of the answers is the the places that I have personally have found the most sense of hope don't reside in nation states. So these ideas of like a place where everything is fixed so much as moments. Um, I think specifically of some of those early huge Black Lives Matter protests that were happening a couple of years back um, when we would just completely, you know, with no organizing or planning or nonprofit behind us, absolutely take over the streets of New York City and then streets across the world were being taken over by people, you know, with a very clear set of, of goals and, and just getting their voices heard, our voices heard across the world. And you know, laying down in streets, you know, shutting down bridges, like, and these movements are still happening. Um, and and really, the point isn't how big they are, but really those small moments. I remember the feeling of when you would be at one of those rallies, and then you would dip out to take the train back home at the end of the night or whatever, four o'clock in the morning sometimes. And how sudden it felt like, you know, walking outside into the cold after being in a warm, toasty house with a fireplace, you know. Because suddenly you're in a world again where, you know, that, that I, everything just is, is uh, closing in on you. And, and of course, like movements are complex and movements are, are still laden with power and problems and hierarchies. Um, but we did create these little moments of, of beauty, of freedom within very oppressive societies. And I think of those as, um, to, to my earlier statement, you know, I think of those as, as bonfires. And I think that when we keep putting them on, setting them up and setting things on fire, not literally, sometimes it is, um, that the world does change. And we change the world in part by, yes, like policies changing and letting people know that we exist and that we care and this, and also creating spaces that are about freedom and, and going directly and headfirst into the complexities of that and dealing with it and figuring out what that means and not trying to erase the past or pretend everything was great when it wasn't or will be when it won't, um, but actually deal with the reality at hand. That to me is a form of utopia. And I think that if, if, if it's in these islands of fire in the darkness, that that's what we got. And that's, that's beautiful. There's, there's nothing to feel hopeless about the fact that right now what, what we have are these moments um, because moments transform lives and they become longer and longer and this shit ain't linear anyway. <laughs> that was a great slogan. Like, Do that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Sloan or Afu, do you want to walk us through a a, a, a thing you saw that sure. you unspooled? Yeah. Does it have to be um, like a human-based interaction? Nope. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, one thing that really inspires, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one thing that really inspires my speculative work um, is uh, incorporating like non-human um, biologies and ecologies, and into my stories and extrapolating them out into whole worlds. So, um, like coral and slime molds, I've always been fascinated by you know and how they communicate with each other. Um, I've always been fascinated with coral just because it's like, you know, you have all these like tiny microscopic beings that secrete all these like harder calcic shells and then they basically form their own world. Um, so like Prism Stalker takes a lot of inspiration from that where the whole world is a living being, the planet and also the architecture and it's constantly shifting and you have to be in communication with it. Um, and uh, I also, yeah, that's also a question I've gotten before about like, how do I know it's worth it to like explore a concept or a world that you're building? Um, that's hard with art because I think anything that's like engaged in your interest and curiosity is valuable um, to me, uh, it can be valuable to you as a human, maybe not financially in the end, but you know, <laughs> um, you don't really, you never really know when something's going to be like financially viable. I don't think that should be important when you're making art, but you know, um, but yeah, I, anything that's, I don't know, making you feel something and like drawing you forward, I think is worth speculating on and interrogating. Um, and yeah, I'm just endlessly fascinated with the biological world and, um, kind of destroying the barrier we've created between nature and ourselves, which I think is something that's also not um, 
questioned ever. We've we've separated ourselves ourselves so much from our the natural world, and when we see our futures, like it's almost never incorporated into our community or society. We always have like these hermetic worlds. Um, you know, we have like the brutalist architecture. Everything's like chrome and concrete, and like um, yeah, I'm just like. I just think that's such a shame that we're not embracing all these incredible life forms that are right here on our world and just using them as more of a basis to imagine all our futures. I think I was, I was, yeah, I was haunting you on Twitter and you had posted this <laughs> very ethereal thing in the ocean that sort of stretched for like 60 feet or something like that. It was quite- Oh yeah, huge. it's like a giant deep sea worm. And that's, it's a worm, but it's also like a community of smaller organisms. It's so cool. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I, I made, especially um, over the past two years, was music. Um, and if it's okay, I'm going to share some. <laughs> I feel I, um, able. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to sing it. I... Um, uh, what was going on was uh, just the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and actually it was, um, I won't say that it was a Black Lives Matter protest. It was just a protest. It was more of a riot actually here in Georgia because the Black Lives Matter protests or you know their demonstrations happened. And then came the opportunist. Then came those who wanted to take this opportunity to smash up businesses, smash up black businesses, smash up homes and cause chaos. These folks did not have a particular objective except they were angry and bottled up and quarantined and they wanted to hurt someone the way they'd been hurt. And where I understood it, I also tried to encourage people to not burn down their own town. And so one by one, all of the conventions that I had booked started becoming canceled. The book that I was working on, everything that was in my future seemed uncertain. I couldn't go outside. Everyone was afraid. And so I thought of a moment in the book that I'm writing where um, a, a Pascagoula uh, Native American gal named Tulula um, employs the power of a, what she thinks is her water spirit, is her nation's water spirit, but it's actually a lamprey. And what it promises to give her, it doesn't really tell her what it takes. And so this is her realizing that this is not what she thought it was. Um, so I, I wrote this song. I just sat down <laughs> while things were on fire <laughs> around and just wrote this song. Um, it's, it's... Don't look at me right now. I'm not where I want to be. Things didn't work out like we envisioned. I had plans and I had dreams. Yeah, I had dreams, but this is all wrong. Oh, this is all wrong. But somehow it's where I want to be. Oh, this is where I ought to be. I can't be lost, no. Because this place is made for me. I thought there'd be more than this. Who 
pussies fast when they're trees. I got a branch out, I gotta leave. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, what's wrong with me? Cause I feel right in the middle of this country. This is our home. But this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Um, um, that Sloan, did you want to say something? You unmuted yourself. I want to give you a chance to talk if you did. Oh, sorry. I know I was just doing a little applause. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. I, I think it's interesting, you know, uh, uh, Daniel had just gestured to this during his opening comments that there's a way in which all, um, all work comes back to you, right? That mm. you put something out into the world and eventually it comes back. And sometimes it comes back in human form. And I'm, I'm just wondering like what your engagement has been with people who've come up to you, who know you, who read your work, viewed it, um, received it and sat with it and who come to you and said, this changed my life or, or um, this made me think differently. And if you wanna, if you're comfortable sharing any of those stories of the way in which your work comes back to you. Uh, sometimes it doesn't come back pleasantly, I know, right? There's a way in which sometimes the work we do comes back and everyone's like, that's horrible. I hate it. I can't believe it. Uh, and I've seen people turn, you know, lemonades into or lemons into lemonade in those contexts. But I, how how has your work come back to you, and and in what ways has that been meaningful to you? Okay, I'll start. No. Um, well, for me, it's always a reminder. I think um, every time it happens. It, it it's like a way that the world has of kind of shaking me up a little bit and, and um, getting me out of my own head. You know, as, as I think we all know, like publishing, whether it's comics or prose, is just so full of, I think the hardest thing of publishing, and it's full of crossroads of difficult decisions of just the millions of complexities, right? Not to mention writing a book, but um, publishing <laughs> itself, right? I think the hardest thing is managing expectations. like. Because literally the, the, the range of where a book can land just in basic terms of like success or what that means or numbers is so huge and, and vast mm. and ridiculous. And you can really go bonkers trying to sort out what it's gonna look like, what it's gonna feel like, you know, which book is gonna do what and how and whether that matters and what that means about you. It's such a mind game and there's no way beyond what we spoke about earlier, which is community, you know, which is like good mentorship, which is like people who take care of each other and don't lie to each other. Um, mm. There's no way to know how to navigate that. Um, but that's not the most important thing. You know, as Sloan alluded to, like money is a part of this game, but it can't be the whole game. And, and in some ways it can't be any of the game. It depends on how you're moving, but it's complex, right? Because um, these are also like, our career sometimes. And this is like how we put food on the table too, right? So we're all entwined with it in different ways. And it is a, a vast machine. But then there are those moments when someone comes up to you out of a crowd or you get that email and it's like, you know, I didn't think I could write until I read your book. Um, I didn't know what it felt like to find home in the pages of a fantasy book until I read mm -hmm. your book. And those matter so much in part because selfishly, it shakes me loose of the game. Um, but also because as you heard, like that's my origin story, what I was telling y'all in my opening piece. And like to know that like someone didn't go through that, right? And, and that I was a part of someone not going through that process of, of just total alienation from the genre that we care about. Like that's why I got into this in the first place. That's always been my most important measure of success. And, and it's so necessary to be reminded of that. And, you know, to hear that directly from the lips of, particularly young people, but really just all people, you know, I think the best thing is when art begets other art. Like, I, I feel such a sense of gratitude towards art that's made me want to create. And, and so when people come up to me and they're like, you know, when I read Shadow Shaper or, or whatever it may be, and I realized like, I, I, and it inspired me to tell my story, like, that's why I do this, you know? And, and also like paying rent is nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're trying to figure out all of these levels to it. But we can just get so lost in like, you know, accolades and other things and like 
those mm -hmm. reminders are just so, so important. So I'm grateful to them. And the last thing I'll say is like, we talk a lot about like readers finding themselves, but and I had this experience yesterday, like when you're seen fully, when your work is really fully seen and, and taken apart in a good way, like when, when you find a reader who's gonna like analyze it and get in depth with it and pick up all the little pieces that you drop on purpose along the way for them to pick up, that's, we feel seen, we the artists yes. feel seen, you know, like, and that's such a gift. <laughs> like, that's such an incredible moment of, again, healing, you know, to go into those rooms and those spaces and be recognized for the things that you were putting down. There's nothing like that. I mean, um, when I go to comic conventions, um, I, I love interacting with with, I, I don't like calling them my fans because they're more like extended family because we, we both know the same characters and love the same characters. So they're kind of like our mutual friends. Um, but one way I see my work coming back to me is when children come over or parents bring their children. Because my dad, he did not want me to become an artist not because he didn't believe in me, but he didn't believe in the path of art. He didn't think that it was for us. He, he didn't think that there was a place for us in it. And as much as he encouraged me to make things, he didn't want me to be disappointed. So a lot of times, you know, I'll hear artists saying like, oh, well, I wanna be an artist. I wanna do this particular kind of art. And my parents are not supportive or my family members are not supportive. And it's not because they don't believe in you or your vision. It's because they don't necessarily know that every, almost everything is touched by an artist. The, the packaging at the grocery store, the signs on the highway, the, the different decisions that we make from graphic design to whether or not we're going to purchase something the art and how well it's constructed will influence that decision. We don't really see what's inside the box. We see the artwork that illustrates what's in there. And so understanding that, you know, not every kind of art job that we get is going to be our dream job necessarily. Um, but being able to share with art students, like, oh, okay, every job that you have from now until you know, you're making what you want will be a paid learning experience for you. Um, but when kids come over, when parents bring their kids over, I always take time and I ask them what they like to draw. And some of them are familiar with my work and one in particular named Honora would come over and she would tell me what artwork of mine she studied this year and she would show me the pieces that she made. Um, uh, in particular, my mermaid, she, she liked my mermaids. And she told me, I really liked your color schemes. So I decided to add another element to your mermaids. Smell. I decided to recreate your mermaids with scratch and sniff. And I wanted you to have it. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> my heart, <laughs> my heart is sweating. <laughs> And then a, a little girl, she was very, very little, she purchased, she, when she purchased my, my art book, she was three, and now she's five, and, you know, she was familiar with my work, but not necessarily with me. I was in costume dressed as Wonder Woman at NC Comic Con, and her father comes over and says, my daughter is your littlest, biggest fan, and, um, she wants to take a picture with you um, because she thinks you're Wonder Woman. <laughs> and so, and this was at the time when uh, the first Wonder Woman movie had come out. And after that moment, every time the trailer came on, she would point to the television and say to her dad, dad, that's my friend, Afua. <laughs> that's Wonder Woman, I know her. <laughs> So I thought to myself, okay, that little girl is going to grow up in a world where she sees me as potentially Wonder Woman. I can fold up all my sketchbooks. I am done. <laughs> I, am, I don't have to draw another thing. I am so happy to see that. So happy to be a part of that. Um, 
but of course I'm going to keep making things because I'm never satisfied. So. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, similar experiences. Just, I'm always, you know, thrilled when people connect with characters or the story, or they feel like seen in a way they hadn't before. That's always rewarding to me. Um, I think one exchange that I thought was pretty cool is this uh, professor of like Hawaiian history and studies um, did a whole presentation about um, the concept of Po in Hawaiian, which is like this like primordial um, kind of like metaphorical place of the gods uh, mm. and the concept of like um, just like infinite potential and space. And um, they connected that to a lot of the themes in Prism Stalker, which was like interesting because I have a little bit of, I don't know, growing up in Hawaii, I could, I didn't really get to go into Hawaiian immersion because you had to have a certain like blood quantum to be able to enroll in those classes. So my, uh, you know, engagement with Hawaiian history is very limited. Also the school I was in was just like terrible anyway. So it was pretty useless all around. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't have a deep understanding of that concept, but the way she was able to like dive into it and like, excavate those parallels between that concept and prism sector was really cool and it like gave me a whole new um I don't know kind of perspective on my own work and drew links to stuff that I hadn't like fully connected before in like a really vivid way because I just didn't have the full understanding because I just didn't have access to it um so that was really neat for me um and I think the other thing I enjoy um like the type of reaction is when, um, like Daniel said and Afua said, is when my work, you know, kind of like makes other people want to make artwork. I find that like the most rewarding when it empowers someone to want to express themselves. Um, especially because like, I don't know, I, I didn't go to school. I don't have any higher education. I didn't go to art school or anything. And, you know, a lot of people feel like they need that sort of um, education to be able to express themselves in this, in creative mediums. Um, so there's this instant barrier that they kind of like exact in their heads. Um, and when they find out that I'm just like, you know, self-taught or like I just taught myself by, you know, copying book, copying comic books and art and reading books, then, then they feel like, oh, oh, well, if they, you know, if they can do it, then I can do it too. Um, and that's always like rewarding to me. Absolutely. <laughs> One, one of the cool things about being a part of this conversation is how um, how uh, optimistic and pessimistic you're all at the exact same moment in time. Which makes sense <laughs> given, given that so much of the genre of the speculative depends on on that interplay. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering where you think it's going. Like we, we're describing this wonderful moment with a great sense of community and people engaged in the work alongside you who support you and younger generations who come up having having seen what you have created or what others have created, seeing themselves in the work to use Daniel's earlier description and basically being able to imagine a future from early on that includes them in it. Uh, and yet, you know, the we're also in the age of Dune, the third iteration, yet another white savior complex, Lawrence of Arabia set in space. And I just wonder like what, what you think of that, what you think of a moment where like we have these this extraordinary rich possibility of things like Black Panther and you know um, yet another repeated iteration of a of what is an amazing but still fairly tired and at this point well done over science fiction epic that centers um, a white man as the savior of a planet. I mean, you summed it up pretty well right there. That was it. Right? <laughs> right. I, think, um, I, I would say like, you know, the, um, what we haven't had, what, what, what feels new to me in this moment is um, this kind of moment of, to Sloan's point, you know, mass media being in conversation with a lot of these topics that we haven't been able to have. Much like what I was speaking about with the internet, like, you know, conversations about diaspora, about a lot of the complexities of existing as a person of color in this country, in this world, um, are rising to the surface because creators are getting into spaces where we weren't allowed before, where, um, where we were kept out of, gatekept, um, both by lack of seeing ourselves there and by actual gatekeeping. And mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and, and so now we're able to talk about them in different ways and it's not enough. And there's still going to be, you know, <laughs> the old guard of all the nonsense going on and it's going to, the gatekeeping continues, you know? So we're, we're all sort of like, I think, you know, we know that we, we feel it with no one. I certainly wasn't surprised by like yet another white savior story dropping. Um, the, the gowns were beautiful, you know, like it's like, like, and it's like each of us has to kind of decide like what we're going to take from that and build on it or just like cast it aside entirely and move forward. I, I guess at the end of the day, like when it comes to this movement and this world that we're moving through right now as artists, as writers, as creators, I do feel really hopeful. I do feel really inspired. And I do feel like we're making a change that matters and that will last. And it is a complex one and it's not simple. You know, I don't believe in straightforward 100%, you know, black and white wins or losses, but mostly I look at the young people and the young people are making moves and they're brave and they're courageous in, in ways that uh, I think our generation wasn't. And, you know, our generation was courageous in ways that the generations before weren't. And you know, there's a movement, and it's it's hard to navigate. It's confusing a lot, but mostly what I see is young people that care a lot about the world they're coming up in, and are willing mm -hmm. to fight, and, and you know, willing to learn, and willing to listen to each other, and that's amazing to me. And I, I'm not trying to put it all on them because I think we have to do our part. It's not like, all right, we're done. Good luck, guys. You know, <laughs> when, I, when I'm thinking about like what's ahead and I look at the work that they're doing and their engagement in the world, I do feel hope. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I do, representation is an interesting topic just because, you know, like, I, I don't know if this is like how common knowledge this is, but you know, there's that like hashtag of like, uh, what is it? What was the hashtag that was about like, like publishing was using it and it was about like, you know, Oh, 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 own, own stories, own, own voices, own voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. that was popular for a little bit. Uh, and then people were like, actually, this is kind of, you know, not great because, you know, maybe we have, you know, you have, uh, you know, a person telling their own story, but the only ones that would really get through the door were ones that were, you know, like kind of tailored to be like palatable to a wider mm. white audience. Um, so like to me on the grant, like on, the higher scale of media like Dune and like, you know, blockbuster movies, the more money that's involved, the more corrupted it's going to be by a committee of, you know, investors that are invested on, in making a, you know, not a piece of art, but in making money. And they're gonna cater towards the wider audience, which is usually the white audience, you know? Um, and also the investors again are usually white or they're usually of a, you know, I don't know. They're, they're just like, they're not interested in social change. They're interested in money. So the more money that's involved in art, the less it's going to, to me, have the ability to speak to, you know, anything that's like, like that has to do with like justice or truth. <laughs> um, so to me, my hope lies that people will, um, again, pursue smaller art, um, being able to support, you know, black, brown, and other marginalized people like through Patreon, like support these people directly. And like, I don't know, uh, I saw some people that were like, oh, we got to support like Eternals because, you know, you have like the, you know, you have this like BIPOC cast and that's like, you got to support the BIPOC. You're, when you go to Eternals, you're supporting Disney. <laughs> you know, these, this cast has been paid, like they're going to be fine. And it's fine if you don't care, like enjoy your movie. It's totally cool. But don't think that you're you know, affecting some sort of justice if you go to a Disney movie. You're not. <laughs> so my hope is that people will, I don't know, kind of learn to separate like representation from actual like change. You know what I mean? So yeah, I don't know if that's clear, but yeah. <laughs> what I'm seeing a lot of is um, independent innovations. The Larger companies, are, and I say this often, they're like giant ships. They're aircraft carriers. They have a lot of resources. They have a big crew. They have a lot of fuel. And they can go really far, much further than someone in a speedboat. But what people in a speedboat can do that these larger ships cannot 
is navigate between the rocks. They can tell the stories that these larger companies who are you know, beholden to shareholders can't tell. They can tell the more nuanced stories. They can tell the things that really, really get to you and are very, very specific that they're really not willing to take the risk on because they want to cast such a large net. They're not going to put out bait for just one type of fish. And so where that leaves you as the creator is giving you an opportunity to fill a niche that has not been filled. Uh, again, how your art can be of service. What's missing? What is it that you can make that, not that you're gonna make something that's totally original. You're going to take your life experiences and pour them into this. But in addition to making something for a smaller group or something that's very specific, you're also creating it for another generation because the people who are coming up now, they're going to be experiencing things in a completely different way than my generation or the generation before us. You know, but they're still going to have some of the same realizations. They're still going to be going into adulthood. They're still going to be a medium adult going into super adulthood. And all of these different transitions where you're supposed to know exactly who you are as soon as you get out of high school and find your career path and study that and you're just going to have a career after that and by 30 everything's going to be awesome <laughs> maybe not <laughs> and so these stories are going to be guiding people these stories are, are going to change and inspire these stories are going to entertain people who are where you are right now and so they're going to need they're going to need the hero story they're going to be reminded that you know Sometimes things are not going to be okay, but you can still make it. And everything doesn't necessarily have to be hopeful. You don't have to cater yourself to your audience, but make what you know and make what's true. And I think I'm seeing that with a lot of creators. I was a judge for uh, Comic-Con Africa, and I got to judge just some really phenomenal artwork from all over the continent, from you know the Democratic Republic of Congo to Zimbabwe to Egypt. And what I was seeing was fantastic. These were self-taught artists like myself who were taking the resources that they had and making something beautiful. And they were using free programs and they were using whatever they had access to. And they were showing up and they were on par and they were hungry. And so what I'm seeing is people who are coming to the realization that, yeah, you know, Marvel and DC might not look for me and that's fine. Uh, I'm going to make my own and I'm going to love myself enough to support my work. So that means I'm going to build a community. That means I'm going to create social media, you know, and, and share it. I'm going to support my artwork like a business. So that's what I'm seeing with a lot of like younger people there. They're kind of veering away from these larger companies and they're making their own. And that's really exciting. We're, um, we're almost out of time. I want to give you each a chance to tell us quickly what you're working on now before we bid adieu and, and uh, uh, say goodbye to our audience. Danielle, what are you working on right now? Um, so my next uh, young adult book is called Ballad and Dagger. And um, I think of it a lot as in conversation with this conversation. It's about a kid named Mateo, who's a, a young piano player in Brooklyn, who's from this island called San Madrigal uh, that was in the Caribbean and just mysteriously sank 15 years ago. And before it sank, it was home to pirates, Sephardic Jews, and Santeros from Cuba. And they all created this weird outlaw culture together that was kind of off the map, under the radar, that pirates didn't mess with or know about. And they just hid for centuries and then vanished. And everyone that survived ended up in Brooklyn, as we do. And they brought all of their gods <laughs> and their monsters and their songs and their rituals along with them. And Mateo finds out he's much more a part of the mythology than he ever realized. And he has to kind of contend with also being a healer and having the magical power to heal, which he never wanted or asked for. And he falls in love. So it's called Battle of Battle. <laughs> it's part of um, uh, my new series is, is called Outlaw Saints and it comes in May. 
And then besides that, I always have ongoing work with Star Wars The High Republic, which is also kind of a utopia story. It's 200 years before the fall of the Jedi and the Skywalker mess and all that shit that happened. Awesome. And it's the high, the high time, the, the golden era of the Jedi. So it's a lot of fun. Very cool. Yeah. Well, what are you working on right now? I am um, I am working on the start of a quarterly series called Aquarius, the Book of Myrrh. It's a modern retelling of mermaid myths and legends from all over the world. And each issue um, will be uh, released through Image Comics in May, Mermaid 2022. And uh, each quarterly issue on the solstice and equinoxes will have a song that accompanies it that I'll be performing and producing. And um, um, secret, secret, I am working on a pitch deck for the cartoon and we'll see where it lands. So I'm crossing fingers. Um, so that's where I'm, I'm working on now. Fingers crossed. Sloan, what are you working on? Um, I'm working on the next volume of Prism Stalker, which should be out next year. Um, my new book, Grave and I, comes out, well, it's out digitally now, and then the print will be out uh, at the end of this month, which is a horror graphic novel drawn by my friend Anna Bowles. It's super beautiful, and it follows two women um, who both have their own secrets and obsessions. Um, again, from the perspective of a sentient house. So yeah, I am really awesome. proud of this book. <laughs> That's exciting. I want to read those like right now. Like I, yeah. I need them in my lives like now. <laughs> I have multiple lives, I guess. Cat yeah. lives. I don't know. I was just yeah. like. <laughs> sure. Listen, on, on behalf of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, let me thank the three of you for what's been a great conversation uh, thank the audience for sticking with us, and I wish you all the best of luck and hope our paths cross again sometime soon. Thank you so much for thank having Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. It was great talking with you all.